Hi, it's Jan Beta, and today I'm going to try to resurrect this wonky Amiga 500 Revision 5 board that gives me a yellow screen. This is an Amiga 500 board that I've owned for quite a while. It was one of the first eBay auctions once I got back into retro computing shortly after I started my YouTube channel, I think. And it was working when I got it. So I'm not sure what happened along the way, but now, as you can see, it gives me an intermittent yellow screen, kind of. It uh, shows the yellow screen color and then goes blank and then shows yellow again. And the Kickstart ROM actually has some basic error handling on these early revision Amigas. Uh, this is a 1.2 Kickstart ROM, so there's an error handling that gets triggered once the machine is uh, turned on. And if everything is alright, it goes through the regular boot sequence of uh, the screen turning several shades of grey, white and then showing the Kickstart logo, the workbench disc with the hand. If there's a color showing, it is usually an indication of something being wrong with the Amiga and the boot process obviously doesn't continue after that. There are several lists online for these color codes and I've looked the yellow color up and the yellow usually means an untraceable error. So the yellow means that an error occurs before the proper error handling is Started. So something is fundamentally wrong with this. One word about those color error codes and the LED flashes on these Amigas. They are not very accurate, but usually they give you a hint towards the thing that is at fault in the Amiga. They help troubleshooting. So the yellow one is unfortunate because all it tells me basically is that the processor is probably started up fine because the routine is started, the error handling stuff. The Kickstart ROM seems to work fine because the same reason basically the code is executed and uh, our graphics strip, the knees, seems to be working fine at this point. Basically everything else could be at fault. There could be broken traces, there could be wonky sockets, which I think is the main culprit on this particular one, but we're going to have a look. The first thing that I suspect to be faulty is the Agnes socket. The Agnes is basically uh, the main switching thing that connects the memory to the processor and basically everything else in the system in these Amigas. And uh, these sockets are really wonky usually. These are PLCC sockets to have these square packages here and they are infamous for making bad contact over the years. As I said, this worked fine. I have recapped this completely and it did work after that. I replaced several resistors. Unfortunately, I, I think I shot videos of my initial troubleshooting of this. I started troubleshooting this at some point. That's why one of these chips is socketed here. I suspected the RAM to be at fault, but that was like ages ago and the footage is Probably it is on some hard disk, but I couldn't find it. So I'm just going to start over from scratch with what we have here, which is a yellow screen Amiga 500. There are some wonky things in here. I can see that this uh, CIA socket doesn't really grab the chip. Each time I move the board around, this chip just pops out slightly. The other ones seem to be fine. Yeah, that's one of my main suspects at the moment and also the Agnes socket. So I think the first thing before I even do anything else is to just replace those two sockets and see if that gets us somewhere. Long story short, I'm just going to replace this socket because it is wonky, the chip is coming out and this socket because it always causes problems in these Amigas. If you have random Amiga 500 issues or Amiga 2000, which use basically the same chipset, with some additional chips for the expansion cards. This is one of the main culprits in all the Amiga 500 repairs and 2000 repairs that I attempted. And I have several of these uh, PLCC sockets in stock. I also have some 40 pin sockets and some 48 pin sockets for the larger chips. I think I did some oscilloscope probing on this because there's a sticker here on the CPU with the pin out. 
So I think I probed uh, the address lines and the data lines and things like that. I'm pretty sure this stuff is all okay because the error handling code is executed. So the processor at least has to work to some extent. Maybe there's something wrong with the data path between the RAM and the chipset or maybe there's something else wrong. But yeah, the sockets are a good place to start in my experience. And that's purely going from experience, really. And from the fact that this chip just pops out every now and again. Yeah, that's really loose in there. So I'm pulling these. Uh, you want to use a proper PLCC chip puller for the Agnes chip. Because it's very easy to damage these sockets even more than they, than they are naturally. I'm just going to desolder these. Adding some flux here, which always helps a bit. And I think I resoldered some of these joints now that I see this board because I already suspected something wrong there. Cut to the desoldering montage and resoldering. <laughs> So I got the old sockets out and I don't think I did any damage to the traces in the process. Oh, looks pretty good. I'm going to inspect this a bit closer, but first I'm going to clean this a bit with alcohol from both sides. So I can't see any scratches or anything on this side. I scratched a bit of the solar mask off there, I think. Uh, you can see the copper shining through. But the copper traces run where they should run, so I'm not too worried about that. There's a bit of copper shining through there on this trace in particular. And this is going to be uh, covered with solder once we solder in the new socket anyway, because it's going to be wicked in there or on there. And then there's nothing to worry about. And here's where the CIA socket was all looks good too. Don't see anything there. Absolutely beautifully desoldered. And now in go the new sockets. We need a 40 pin socket for the CAA and one of those. I don't know how many pins these have actually. 48? Probably more. Otherwise they would just have used one of those packages. I'm not going to count all these. <laughs> Somebody is going to tell us in the comments I guess. Yeah. We need one of these. I'm going to solder that in first. And usually what I do is to solder one pin each uh, diagonal. So it holds in place, soldering these while I'm actually holding this in place from the other side with my hand. And then I go in and solder everything properly again. And the same basically applies for the PLCC socket. And for the PLCC sockets, they actually have a little arrow pointing at pin 1, which is also marked on the board, so you want to get them in, in the correct orientation. Ideally, they also work in other di directions, but uh, yeah, just to make things easier later on. And I'm using one of these brown ones because these are actually very high quality sockets that I bought a while ago, AMP brand. Not sure where I bought them actually, but... Yeah, they are really good, way better than what Commodore used. And I'm doing the, the same thing here. I'm tacking two pins on opposing sides and see if it's oriented straightly. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> and now all the pins are going to be soldered in. Let me take a couple of seconds to thank the sponsor for this video at this point, PCBWay, my favorite manufacturer of prototype PCBs of all kinds. 
They also do sheet metal fabrication, 3D printing, CNC machining, basically everything the tinkerer needs. So I highly recommend checking out their website. Their pricing is super reasonable, service is great and they have really quick turnaround times. Check out the link in the video description if you are interested. Back to the Amiga. So I got the two new sockets in. Now it's time to put the ICs in and I'm just going to give the ICs a bit of a wipe with some alcohol as well, I think. Chances are this is going to be a working Amiga. I hope this is going to be a working Amiga at some point in this repair, but maybe this already is the repair. <laughs> I also like to put some contact cleaner into the sockets before I put the chips in. Yeah, this has a pin one marking as well. There's a little indentation on one of the sides and you basically just line them up so they are level and then just gently push them down on all four corners. And that should be nicely in there. For the 40 pin CAA chip, I'm just using my leg straightener here, which is just wonderful, actually. Yeah, that should be in there. I also noticed that this Gary chip has some green spots on the legs there, so I'm going to pull that and take a look at the socket and also clean it up. Clean up the legs a bit because that doesn't look good. I don't know where this came from. Socket looks good, although it is one of those super cheap sockets that Commodore tended to use, uh, which only have one leaf grabbing from one side on the chips, chip legs. These are very prone to failure as well. That might be one of the culprits as well. But the chip has some green, got a green tinge there. That's not good. I'm going to scrub this a bit for a while and I'll be right back. So I'm actually getting out my fiberglass pen for this because on some of these pins there's quite a bit of green stuff there and I think I want to clean that off. Usually these work really well on chip legs. It's just a fiberglass pen that you can buy in any electronics store. Yeah, that works really well. And the Gary goes back in, in the correct orientation. Yeah, but that socket grips really nicely physically, so that's a good sign. I guess we could be good. Let's uh, test the Amiga. Let's see. Fingers crossed this was the only thing that's wrong with it. Nope. <laughs> no difference whatsoever. Okay, that's unfortunate. So we're going to have to dig a lot deeper, I guess. This is exactly the same that it did before. I think I want to put a diagram in there and see if that shows me anything. So I put uh, an old EEPROM with an old version of the diagram in, which is a diagnostics ROM you can replace the kickstart ROM with. And you need an adapter and swap some pins around for these earlier Amiga 500 boards. And I believe also for the earlier Amiga 2000 boards because they left out some uh, resistors and connections accidentally. Let's see if the diagram starts up at all. Okay, fingers crossed the diagram gives us something. Yeah! That actually looks normal. The flicker is actually normal for the diagram startup. Looks a bit funky and everything was green there, I think. But I don't have any input devices hooked up to this, so hang on a second. <laughs> so I hooked up a keyboard now. I also hooked up a mouse which apparently doesn't work. It should move the selection in diagram and the buttons should at least start the respective menu item there. Keyboard seems to work though. So let's go through some of these tests, I guess. So let's get the sys info here. Everything seems green except it says uh, 
if we have stuck buttons and keys at boot bad Paula. I don't know if that's if it says that every time. Uh, Paula also, I think, the Paula chip does a lot of things in the Amiga and it partially is responsible for the mouse, I think. Maybe that is actually a fault indicator. We're going to, let's, let's see the other tests. Audio tests. Paula is famously the audio chip. So let's see, simple waveform test. I hooked up the connectors for the audio. Oh, we don't get anything outputting there. The volume turned down or something? Nope. That should be audible. Yeah, no, we don't have any audio output. This should play a little piece of music. The diagram anthem, actually. Okay, so that doesn't work as expected. That's suspicious. Let's do some memory tests. Uh, test the detected chip, ma'am. I think this one also didn't do anything on the Revision 3 Amiga I was working on. Maybe that's just broken in software. So let's go to the extended chip mem test, which should be the more in-depth RAM test anyway. And let's run that for a while. Yeah, that seems to be all good so far. Yeah, 512k. We have an address error detected. Some IRQ stuff is happening there. That's not quite correct in the CPU registers. I'm not quite sure. There's not a lot of documentation about the diagram. So I think we have some interrupt stuff happening here. Let's do some IRQ testing. Testing IRQ levels. Press any key to start. Okay. Okay, that failed right away. So the interrupts, I think mostly handled by CPU and Agnes in this system, but also running through the whole system, obviously. <laughs> yeah, that last one is always going to fail. We have failing interrupts. That's not good. Testing the CIAs. Okay, we also have the odd CIA failing there. Oh, and it doesn't even continue after that, it seems. <laughs> That's not a very good sign. So that just crashes diagram. That's not a very good sign. I'm just trying to do the uh, manual keyboard reset here. Let's see if that works. That works. Okay, let's do the other CAA test. New experimental test. Press any key to start. Okay, it says fast for NTSC, but I think that's actually normal because this is a PAL machine. So it fails on one of the video standards there, normally, the one you don't have. This test for the CAAs tells me that the CAAs might be okay. Let's do some graphics test just for kicks. That should all be good because if something was horribly wrong with the Denise graphics chip, the graphics would look corrupted in any case, even the graphics just in this menu. Yep, that works. Raster, that works. RGB, that looks excellent. Picture output is actually pretty crisp. Port test we can't do because we don't have any test harness, we don't have a drive, we have a keyboard, but that seems to work fine. Other tests, uh, RTC, real-time clock, we don't have that. Autoconfig, we don't need that. Pretty worried about the audio not working, I'm not sure. Maybe I try another Amiga and see if the audio output works in my setup here, just for sanity checking. Sound output works on my crystal Amiga here, which is also an Amiga 500, just uh, a revision 6 board in there and it's also pretty loud so we clearly don't have audio on the other Amiga board not because my audio setup is messed up here yeah so what are we going to do I think we might have a broken Paula chip or we might have a broken socket let's take a look so Paula is this one an 8364 I'm going to pull this and clean the socket chip looks very clean and so does the socket but uh, of course you can't see if a chip is broken from the outside. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to spray some contact cleaner in there and try to reseed it. 
because this is one of those single wipe sockets as well, which are notoriously making bad contact. Let's try that again with the sound check. Somebody just started playing music in the backyard here, so the music you're hearing is not from the Amiga, unfortunately. <laughs> Let's test the mouse as well. There was one burnt resistor here that I replaced, which is the resistor that supplies the 5 volts to the mouse and the joystick, I believe. And that is EMI401 on the Amiga 500. And that is a common fault if you don't get any mouse movement. That's a burnt resistor, probably, maybe. Let's see if we get any mouse reaction now, probably not. Do the audio test again, simple waveforms. Okay. Nope, no audio out, out at all. That is very interesting. I have to dig for another Paula chip, that's the quickest thing to do. I probably have one. And Paula is not that common a fault. Usually these are really reliable. But it might be broken, these things happen. I'm going to pull that again and look for a replacement. And it may be that all the strange IRQ faults we saw are related to that. Would make sense. We don't have any sound. We don't have the mouse working. Okay, I found one. Just going to pop this in here. No audio with another Paula that allegedly is a working Paula. The other th thing that could be at fault is the other, uh, the odd CAA, actually. So the CAAs are really common to fail. That might just be an issue here. Just going to try to use another CAA. Do I have any of those? Oh, I just got a donation recently. Let me find that. And this came from Canada from another Jan. They sent me two Amiga CAAs and a couple of circuit boards. Nope, no audio order at all. That is really strange. I never had that in an Amiga. So several possibilities. There could of course be something wrong with the board itself. But given that this worked and it just replaced chips on here, I wonder. The RAM seems to be okay. That tested fine. Just showed me some weird IRQ errors. Uh, I think I'm going to have to get in with the oscilloscope and like see. I never, never had an Amiga that didn't output sound at all. That's kind of odd. So something is not addressed correctly, probably. Just in case you're wondering why I'm not heading to the oscilloscope straight away, I know that many people don't have a fancy digital oscilloscope like uh, I have here thanks to a sponsorship deal a couple of years ago. And uh, yeah, I just want to try to use the simplest stuff I possibly can. And if I'm just wildly swapping chips around, that is for a reason, because that is a quick way and I have a huge stash of chips. So that's a very quick way of ruling out stuff. Funnily enough, I just found a 1.3 kickstart ROM that I just swapped in out of curiosity. And this one actually goes through nearly all the steps of the startup process and the LED uh, goes bright and we have a white screen, which is the last step before the system is initialized. It doesn't go, it doesn't go on from there. It should uh, take a while to initialize the disk drive and then go into the uh, hand with the disk logo, kickstart logo, but it doesn't. So, but, but this gets, uh, further than the 1.2 ROM. I have another 1.2 ROM here. Maybe I'll try that. <laughs> yeah, no, the 1.2 gives us a yellow screen, which is like an unusual exception. And we get a blinking LED actually, which I didn't see because the keyboard was not connected. But this is only for the 1.2 ROM. I think I would guess that the error handling routines in the uh, 1.3 revision of the ROM are a bit better, but you never know. So how many flashes do we actually get? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Yeah, ten and then one long one. Let's look that up. The eleven blinks 
of the power LED can mean a lot of things. In combination with the green screen, they usually point to a problem with the Agnes or with the RAM. And uh, they are just a general indicator of a fault. As far as I understand from my quick research online. But this is uh, something else, definitely. And it still says the A timing too fast and crashes after that. So it's exactly the same with the other chips in here. So it's not the chips very likely. Uh, at least not the, the custom chips. So yeah, maybe we can see something on, this, on the scope. Let's try that for a change. So I poked around with the oscilloscope for a bit and didn't find anything super suspicious. And then I started putting stickers on the chips to actually have the pin out visible. Uh, there's these stickers that I still don't know who made this. This is just a PDF you can print out and cut out the pin outs for the chips and actually stick them on the chips, which is super useful. Uh, I've used this many times. I put the sticker on the Paula at first because that is my main suspect still. The Amiga is running and uh, I have my multimeter set to volts DC. So let's see if we get any voltage on Paula. Did um, Measuring this against ground, we don't get anything close to zero. So we're going to have to find out what's wrong there. Maybe that's all, all the problems we had might just be related to Paula not getting the voltage. I also noticed that Paula stayed suspiciously cold and so does Gary, but Gary, I think, uh, stays cold normally and it and indeed gets its voltage, its supply voltage. Yeah, might just be down to Paula not getting a voltage at all. I was already poking around in the data bus here, uh, which Basically everything runs through these four chips, which are just uh, distributing stuff between things. And uh, the whole data, all the data lines, the interrupt lines also run through these. But the interrupt lines also run through Paula and uh, are generated and interpreted by Paula and then go back to the processor. So Paula is my main suspect for not having audio, uh, for not having mouse input and for uh, crashing the IRQ tests. So yeah, this might just be the whole thing. So here's the flip side of the board and we're going to see if we actually get vaulted. Uh, on this side, the voltage supply should be routed somewhere on the top side of the PCB because there's nothing connected, no trace connected to this pin here, which should be our voltage supply. We don't get anything here. We get logic levels on some of the other pins around here. That's uh, normally if you have uh, like fluctuating logic levels, you get a voltage. On a DC multimeter, you get a voltage like this, like uh, halfway between ground and 5 volts, which is uh, logic low and high, respectively. There is data going in there, but no voltage supply. And so clearly Paula can't do her thing. So let's pull this chip and have a look and see if we can see anything broken there on the path. Maybe there's a broken trace. I can't really see anything. There's this capacitor here in the way. Let's see if that is connected to our pin. Yup. Is the capacitor still good? Do we have a capacitor test? This is very rudimentary on multimeters, of course. Yeah, we have 0.1 microfarads. That should be all right, I guess. So this little capacitor next to Paula uh, is connected to the 5 volt rail, which should be here on this pin. And it goes from here through this wider trace that you can see here to the pin and it actually is connected. So that's good. <laughs> the other side is connected to ground. So that's just a filtering capacitor to uh, filter out noise from the voltage supply to Paula, which makes sense because Paula is responsible for a lot of things, including audio and noise in the audio path is not desirable. Usually all these chips have a filter capacitor for the 5 volt supply 
close to them to filter out high frequency stuff and things like that that could otherwise disturb the chips uh yeah that all looks good i guess and we also have a ground on here which is i presume this one yes this is also a wider trace you can see that coming off there this is our audio ground that I think in the schematics, the audio ground is a separate ground, which would make sense for audio quality, but in the final design, I think they just used the uh, common ground for that. So I'm not sure why we don't get a voltage there. We should uh, measure where that actually comes from. I'm going to follow that and see if we can actually see where our voltage path goes. Can you see it at all? Yes, I think so. So this is our capacitor from the back side uh, and our five volts should be here. And that's coming from the component next to it, which is this resistor here. Okay, let's see what we get uh, close to this voltage wise. I'm just going to hook this up to the power supply and measure the voltage around there. Can't see any broken trace or anything like that at this point, but uh, you never know. So this should already be 5 volts. This is 5 volts. And then this should be transported through this resistor to this side, but it isn't. And there's no 5 volts on the capacitor. So this is our culprit little resistor probably. If I interpret everything correctly, the 5 volt rail, this is pretty much coming directly from the power plug here on one of these large traces and this resistor is connected to here and this should be connected to here. Yeah, this is connected to here and this is connected to the 5 volt rail everywhere. Yeah, this resistor is faulty it seems. Let's see what that is supposed to be. I still can't remember the resistor color codes. I'm sorry, I know everybody's screaming at me. But thankfully we have apps for that now and this resistor type should actually be uh, red, black, gold, gold and that is a 2 ohms resistor with a tolerance of plus minus 5%. Yep, that's like 2 kilo ohms or thereabouts. That's 1000 times as much resistance as would be appreciated for that. <sighs> I don't have a 2 ohms resistor in my stash, but I found this red, red, gold, gold, which is 2.2 ohms. And I think that's going to be fine for our purposes. It's just a voltage supply, maybe going to be slightly lower, <laughs> but it's not going to make a huge difference. This is basically just current limiting, I think. So the voltage should be absolutely suitable for our Paula if we put this one in there. I measured this, it is indeed 2.2 ohms, so should be good to go if we just remove this and put this one in there and put Paula back in and then maybe our issues are going to be resolved or maybe there's more issues, we don't know yet. Stay tuned. So I marked the position of the solder joints for the resistor and going to replace it. Just another day at the office. Often it's the most simple stuff that gets you, or me, <laughs> for that matter. Always think it's something different. And yeah, usually it isn't. It's just the simple stuff that breaks. But resistors are usually, I mean, in the Amigas, this is actually the second one that uh, the similar fault happened in the Revision 3 Amiga that I was working on recently for the power supply to the Denise. There we go. Now it is extracted. Okay, so this one is definitely not a 2 ohm resistor. <laughs> uh, okay, a million times more, roughly. So let's put in the 2.2. Usually that would be the first thing I check the voltage supply to the chips. That should be always, even if the Amiga works, it seems. It's always a good idea. But so much was working, that's pretty interesting. This is probably what the same behavior that we would have without Paula in there, I guess, because it just wasn't powering up at all. So uh, yeah, let's see if we get a voltage 
on our chip now or on our socket at least at this point yes and like 5.1 that's well in tolerance it's going to go a bit lower under load i guess if we put the chip in there and then we can hook everything back up and see if this actually passes the tests now let me clean up this mess uh, for a tiny little bit before i do that at first let's see if we get close to the same behavior without the polar even in there yeah the diagram starts up fine actually let's look at the rq tests yeah, and this is going to be the exact same behavior that we had because uh, basically Paula was just not turned on. <laughs> That's exactly what we had. That is interesting how much of the system works without Paula. We still obviously don't have uh, any mouse activity, but the keyboard works fine. We can do all sorts of tests in Diagram. The 1.3 uh, Kickstart ROM, the regular one, even booted up to a point where it got to a wide screen. I find that super interesting because basically, yeah, there's a chip missing, one of the main custom chips, and that much still works. That is quite awesome. Paul is also, of course, uh, responsible for some of the disk drive functionality and other things. Basically, everything that was left over got integrated into Paula. Yeah, no audio, as expected, without an audio chip. Let's put Paula back in and see if uh, this Amiga is indeed back alive. I am so confident in this repair that I am going to remove the sticker from the processor and from the Paula. <laughs> the sockets are shoddy, so it wasn't. It, it's never a bad idea to replace those if you know what you're doing and if you have some experience with soldering. If you don't, you might break stuff on the boards, but the Amigas uh, of this generation are actually not that difficult to solder on in my experience. Still, I wouldn't replace the socket if I wasn't expecting it to be wonky. And this, uh, the CA8 socket at least felt really wonky. The chip kept popping out, so that was definitely a good replacement. The PLCC socket, maybe we could have gotten away without replacing that, but this is a really nice socket, so I'm happy with that. And I'm going to use this for testing purposes, so probably there's uh, one or two Agnes's Agni popping in and out there once in a while, so that doesn't hurt to have a good socket in there. Yeah, uh, fingers crossed. That was it. Let's see. Yes! Ah, nice sine wave. Oh, let's quit that. Yep. Amiga's back in business. Okay, let's do that IRQ test again. That failed. Yeah, that's how quick that goes. It's all okay now. It was just the voltage supply to the baller chip. <sighs> yeah. Does this CIA test now pass as well? Yeah, it continues now. And everything shows us okay. Interesting. So even the CAA timings are out of whack if you don't have a Paula in there or a working Paula. That is good to know for future reference. I hope I remember this if I ever encounter something like this again. Yeah, and as I said, this test shows you uh, too fast for or too slow probably if you have an NTSC Amiga. It, probably it's going to show too slow for PAL if you have an NTSC machine. I'm not sure. My math may be off there. But yeah, this seems to be fully working now again. That resistor must have broken while I had this and used it for testing. Maybe I popped the chip in there while it was turned on or something and the resistor just couldn't take the uh, current spike. Let's see what the voltage on the polar chip actually is now. I'll stand this up in a fancy way, like some fancy YouTube person. Yeah, we got 4.7 now and 5 on the other end of the resistor. 4.7 is a tiny bit low, so if I find a resistor with exactly the correct value, I'm going to pop that in there. But uh, yeah, to prove the point that it was just this resistor all the way, this was basically the fault that I was hunting this whole time. Let's pop a regular kickstart ROM in there and see if that boots up.
And even the disk drive LED lights up now, so the Paula does its thing. And there we are. It's a normal working Amiga 500 without a yellow screen again. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I hooked up a GoTag and I'm starting up my usual uh, testing program. <laughs> Which is Turrican, of course. And it seems to do what it's supposed to do now. Spend a lot of time with this one. And as I said, I even uh, started troubleshooting this way before I made this video, probably several years ago. And then just put it aside because I couldn't figure it out. And it was just all down to a bit more patience and finding that little resistor there. And doing the steps that you usually do every time you try to fix something like this, even if you don't believe that the thing you are looking for is the culprit, you are going to have to measure the voltages to each of the custom chips. And Diachrom was actually super useful in figuring out that it was Paula that was uh, somewhat related to the fault, because everything that Paula is responsible for, the interrupts, the mouse, didn't work. So it was pretty clear that it was Paula that was somewhat not working correctly or not addressed correctly. Yeah, I am super happy at this point. Yeah, I guess that's it for today. Thank you so very much for watching and your time. Hope you don't feel it was wasted. Special thanks, of course, to all my supporters on Patreon and on the channel memberships page here on YouTube and on Ko-fi and elsewhere. The links to that are in the video description. Should you feel the urge to support me, which would, of course, be highly appreciated. I'm Jan Beta. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye.